Um, our next panel is called The Unspoken Controversy on Fertility, Options, Controversy, and Hope. Um, and we have some amazing speakers. Um, Asha Curran, as you know, she's gonna be moderating it. Uh, Amy Raup, she is author of a new book called Yes, You Can Get Pregnant. It's actually available for sale out in the marketplace. She is an author, acupuncturist, and herbalist. Carolyn Kassan, she is director of the NYU Global Affairs and Professional Studies, and Dr. Sammy David, who is a reproductive endocrinologist. So please give them a warm welcome. Hey again, all. So this is a, a, a panel that I was really intrigued about and that I heard from several people privately that they were really excited to hear. Um, privately being the, the operative word, it seems like conversations about fertility are always private. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was, a, it was a confidential aside. I'm really interested in this one. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely gonna be there for that or I'm definitely gonna watch it on the live stream, uh, which seems to me to be part of the, of the issue here. So um, I'm interested in this topic myself as, as a mother, as a, a friend to many, many women who have gone through huge challenges. Also as a, a childbirth educator for the last 12 years, many of my students who are obviously pregnant have come um, to my classes as a result of you know, a long protracted experience with fertility treatments. Um, and so this panel is about opening up the conversation and destigmatizing it and talking about what so many of us are, are thinking about and, and feeling about. And then separately, what are the actual facts mm -hmm. and what is the misinformation that's out there about it? So I wanna, I wanna turn first to Carolyn, just because this is about telling stories, how we don't tell enough stories about this subject, how we, we don't share enough about it. Um, so I just wanna ground us in sort of a personal experience um, with, with this issue. So Carolyn, do you wanna just tell us a little bit about sort of what your, what your journey was before we go into the more clinical stuff? Sure, and thank you so very much, Asha. And as you had said, I, I do really think that this is a conversation that we should be having more of. So I really um, appreciate you sort of bringing us all together. Um, you know, I guess I was kind of late to get started. I was in a long distance relationship. I was, um, I had finished my PhD. I had just started sort of my first teaching job. Um, which was out of New York. Then I moved back to New York City, um, still in sort of a long distance relationship. And um, I had just turned 40 and my father had just passed away. And I realized, I was like, wait a second, I really want to have a child and I'm, you know, I need to do something about it. So I said to my rather um, um, ch challenged uh, <laughs> boyfriend in terms of commitment, um, I said, I really want to have a baby, so let's, let's make it happen. And um, he was somewhat, you know, a little bit hesitant, but I think, you know, he eventually came around, and I got pregnant very quickly. Um, and I had my first, first child, a little boy, when I was um, 41. And then about a year later, I wanted to have a second. Um, and I got pregnant in the, in, uh, August of 2011, so this was just two years after having, having my, first, my first son, and um, I had a miscarriage at eight weeks. So I, you know, I went to my, uh, my doctor, and she immediately said, well, you know, you're now, 40, you're now 43, actually. <laughs> you're 43, and you know, there are probably fertility issues that you should, um, you should, you know, you should go to a fertility specialist. She said, I can't, I can't work with you at this point, but you know, here's a doctor that I recommend. And I had had the, the very good fortune of meeting Amy um, during my first pregnancy. Um, I was a little bit late, so my, my doctor had uh, suggested that I go to Amy for um, acupuncture. And I had an amazing session with her, and shortly after I'd had my first, she called me to check in. And I think shortly after leaving the doctor's office, after, having the mis um, after being told that I had had a miscarriage, I called Amy. And I said, you know, I, I need to see you. I want to start working with you. And um, so I basically was seeing Amy um, in conjunction at the same time that I had started sort of minimal fertility treatments. I did a Clomid treatment. 
um, that didn't work. Um, and then I did a couple of other sort of procedures that the doctor had recommended, and I still wasn't getting pregnant. But I was seeing Amy at the same time, and she was just helping me to see my fertility in a very different way, and I think a much more, in a way that, um, was much easier for me to relate to. Um, because when I was going to um, NYU in terms of for my fertility treatments, I found it very, very impersonal and I found it very sort of emotionally challenging. I found it very hard on my my relationship that I that I had with my husband. I found that like that whole idea of duty sex, you know, this idea that we had to have, you know, we had to have sex at a particular time. And it was becoming very, very stressful. And Amy was just sort of helping me to sort of like take more control over my fertility and to sort of make some adjustments in my diet, to to start embracing animal fats, <laughs> um, to sort of not look at butter with like horror, but to actually, you know. <laughs> bring butter into my life and um, and she just brought a sense of sort of peace to the process and um, I ended up getting getting pregnant um, in May of 2012 mm -hmm. you know May of 2012 and I, you know, I had my second second boy in January of 2013 he's just 17 months and you know I'm now 45 and you know I I, I look at I look now at getting pregnant and my own sort of experience. You know, my first pregnancy was very blissful and easy, and my second one was sort of filled with sort of challenges that really made me sort of think, oh my goodness, I should have started earlier. You know, these are things that I should have, there are more things that I should have done. But, you know, working with Amy just helped me to look at pregnancy and look at fertility in a, in a much different way than I, that I so appreciate and that I, I think more women and more men really need to sort of, I think, embrace the options and not to immediately think that there's, um, that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. It does, it, it, it makes you wonder the stories that you hear, how many women even successfully go through fertility treatments, get pregnant, but at the expense of so much else in mm -hmm. their lives because that stress is just so overwhelming. Let's deal with that age issue head on. So first Dr. David and then you, Amy. What, what's the deal with age? Because women are certainly made far and wide to feel like if they hit 35, they are advanced maternal age, mm -hmm. first of all, even if they do get pregnant, and that it's practically impossible to get pregnant after that point, and certainly after 40. No, that's totally untrue. But when, when a doctor approaches the patient at 40 years old or 35, he, should, he or she should look at the patient in, in entirety. What we do at Fifth Avenue Fertility, and we have Angela Lee as a wonderful acupuncturist, and Mark Olstein, who's a world-famous fertility specialist, um, we look at the entire picture, so uh, a matter of uh, hormones, anatomy, lifestyle changes, infections, autoimmune issues. And let me tell you that, that people going through IVF, it's like one of the most disempowering mm -hmm. things a woman can go through because you're totally in control. And as you said, they're on an assembly line and you go from one booth to another, you get blood tests, you get sonograms, and you have anesthesia to remove the eggs all for a very good purpose, to create a baby. But nonetheless, there has to be easier ways and better ways to do so. You're not an IVF fan. No. <laughs> well, not as, as, not as, a, as a primary reason. cause, no, you know? And the other thing that really bothers me that I think disempowers women is the fact that they look at the AMH hormone, the FSH hormone, or the age, and I'll say, well, madam, you know, you have no chance right. of getting pregnant. Never is a harsh, harsh word. And some of these doctors really are, are terribly uh, not, not kind. And the other thing that I think uh, d disempowers women is when, you, when I look at car, uh, charts and I see that it's actually a male factor, not a female mm -hmm. factor. So what part of medicine is it where you give your drugs to the wrong person? <laughs> and that's totally not right medicine. And what's behind that sort of default assumption that it's only it the male woman? Show, I, mean, I don't know. It's what always the woman's Sexism. fault. Sexism, that's what I think. So b back to your question about age, it depends on, on a number of factors, yeah. uh, the husband's sperm and so forth. The oldest patient I've had have a full-term baby naturally was uh, 47. She had the baby at age 48. I never say never, so, and nor should a doctor. I agree. Age, as I said to you back there, age is the diagnosis of exclusion. 
the same things that cause infertility in a 35-year-old cause in a 45-year-old. Mm -hmm. So instead of the doctor looking at your age, looking at your AMH, looking at your FSH, and, say, and, and passing some judgment like you're not going to get pregnant or you're going to have a hard time getting pregnant or you have a 1% chance, mm -hmm. I don't know where they get their numbers from, yeah. but it's, that's really disempowering. Mm -hmm. So we try to empower the patient. Yeah. Empowering why? You empower them by education. Mm -hmm. Not just say, you know, they have to know what's being done. They have to know all the various tests are available and pick which ones would be right for them. We try our best not to use artificial fertility drugs, or, but we do, we do, but, but nonetheless, only as a last resort. Amy? Um, yeah, I do not think age is the biggest factor at all. And I do the same in, in my clinic where, you know, my primary goal is to empower my patients. And I say, even throughout the book, the mantra right now is, um, you have the power to change your health and improve your fertility. And a lot of women come to me feeling completely powerless in the whole process. If you look at the statistics, like the hard data, there's very little evidence that, you know, this whole thing that one in three women over the age of 35 are going to have a hard time getting pregnant. So they say about 30% then of women are, are going to get pregnant on their own and the rest are not. And those statistics, I don't know if you read the article in The Atlantic, it came out, I think it was in 2012, um, but it was a, a psychologist who wrote the article and she herself was... Um, going to go through fertility treatments. And she started just researching, where did they get these statistics from? Turned out that they were from um, French birth reports or something like that from the 1600s. Oh. So before oh. electricity or you know antibiotics. And um, so the more current research shows, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of studies that came out in like 2013, I think they were in Fertility and Sterility uh, Journal, published that women between the ages of 35 and 40 who had sex at their fertile times, within one year of attempting, 78% of them got pregnant. And in comparison to women 25 to 35, um, 84%. So it was only a 6% difference. No difference. Will you tell the story that you told backstage about the surprising diagnosis of this patient, this okay. patient you saw? <laughs> a few stories, but let me get, get this one that you wanted. A uh, woman flew in from San Francisco having failed IVF seven times and they wanted some answers. So part of the workup is you do cultures on the husband and the wife, hormones, antibodies, looking to see if the person's actually allergic to the baby, things called killer cells, right? And it turns out the husband has E. coli in his, growing in his sperm, okay? So I give them antibiotics. The doctor in San Francisco says, you really, these are bad eggs, you need donor egg IVF. You need donor egg IVF. So, they go back there and plead, plead with him, let me do one more in vitro with my own eggs. I'm not ready yet to do donor eggs IVF. He said, E. coli has nothing to do with it. So they do, he said, I'll take your money and we'll do in vitro. And sure enough, she gets pregnant, a little boy. A year and a half later, gets pregnant on her own without fertility drugs, without IVF. So again, in medicine, you think of anatomy, environment, infections, autoimmune disorders, mm -hmm. Um, hormones, and, you know, you have to have a broad look at what causes yeah. infertility. And, and again, it causes it in 45-year-olds and it causes it in 35-year-olds. Absolutely. And I think so much of um, our environment now, like the foods we eat, the products we put on our skin, I mean, the stress levels we're exposed to on a regular basis, they really affect our, our health and our fertility secondary to that. So I always talk with my girls about that. It's, it's about getting your body in optimal health mm -hmm. and you should be able to get pregnant in your 40s. It's like, it's not a question. It's, it's a given in my opinion. I mean, there are structural issues, sure, in certain women, but if we're just talking generally, if we improve health, we're improving, even if there's not a lot of eggs left, technically, if your FSH is high or your AMH is low, even so, those numbers are not static and they change, which most people don't don't realize, you know, a girl will come in crying about how high her FSH is, and I don't even really pay attention to it no, anymore. Not uh, and not to be, I have compassion, of course, but I'm, I'm just like, listen, all we care about is how many, there's some eggs left, there's definitely some left. 
we can improve the quality of those eggs and you can get pregnant, you know? And it's, but it is, it's this conversation that's going on now. It's over 35 and everybody's just frantic. And it affects, you know, we were talking the other day on the phone, it affects like the spontaneity in your relationships, like the joy of having sex with your partner. I mean, you're taking away some really important pieces to a relationship. And, you know, there's just so much stress surrounding it. So my goal always is really just working with the patient to empower them and kind of like stepping back into those shoes. Well, it seems like there's two parts to this. So you have this medical sort of infrastructure mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. around it that is A, unkind, mm -hmm. right? And, and when yeah. you're going through something like this or, or really anything to do with pregnancy or childbirth, fertility, anything, kindness is really paramount, mm -hmm. right? It's really, really important. And hope. And hope. And, ho and optimism hope. and hope. Optimism, what doctor, and and what also evidence. It seems like it's not evidence-based. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not, no, but we were talking about this in the green room. Unfortunately, most of the clinics, all of the clinics, I should be honest, um, are statistically driven. They care, they want to be the number one clinic. They sure. want to say, our stats are, you know, 30% of the women that walk through the store have a baby, you know? And so they get really competitive. So when they see a patient and she's, you know, 43 and trying for her second, they're gonna tell her she needs a donor egg because the chances of her getting pregnant that first IVF are super high versus using her own eggs. So it's, you know, it's disappointing, but it's just where it's at. Right, and it's also based on this assumption. I mean, th there seems to be just this wide, widespread default to, well, women just wanna to work too much now. Yeah. So they're just working until they're, they're 40 fault. and then all of a sudden they they're want a kid. Anyway. It's their own fault, yeah. they shouldn't have waited that long. That's a and then they come in beating say. themselves up. They come in beating themselves up, it's, and so everything's already cycle. coming from a baseline I of suffering. I feel like, I mean, and you could vouch for this, half of my treatments are, are you know, therapy sessions. Sure. I'm not sure, a sure, therapist, sure. but I feel like I've become one, yeah. you know? And I think that's also why this conversation does not happen enough, yeah. is because, you know, I thought myself, you know, I, as I said, you know, I had my first, first child when I was 41, and then when I was trying again when I was 43, you know, people were like, you waited so long, you know, you should have, you know, you should have stopped, you should have stopped working. And then I feel guilty, you know, I'm sort of putting that pressure on myself at a time that's, that's just sort of challenging as it is. And, you know, having like hearing from experts and just realizing that there's a totally different story and that we're working, that, you know, we're put, putting women in a paradigm that's, that's just, it's not healthy and it's very right. disempowering. Right. Very disempowering. It really is. And of course there are challenges, right? I mean, as we get older, there are some challenges that can come up. But, you know, if I have like a 47-year-old woman, I mean, I'm definitely thinking, okay, we've got to be aggressive here, you know? <laughs> and she's going to see a reproductive endocrinologist, not just acupuncture typically, you know? Not that I don't have faith in my medicine, but we want to do it together, you know, the pressure's on. I just want to just add, because I think that is so important, because that's something that I learned by working with Amy, is that, you know, she just, you were so able to, like I was able to sort of, go through some fertility treatments, come to you, you were able to sort of help me understand the treatments well, in a much too. more sort of human way. And I don't know how many times I cried on your table. <laughs> um, and you, you, it was just, it was amazing. I mean, so it was amazing for me to have had that experience because I think if I had been doing it just the fertility treatments, I think it would just would have been very debilitating just for myself, just knowing my own sort of like psychology yeah. and, and how I can get down about certain things. So that was, that was huge just to have sort of, sort of a, a sane voice yeah. and a calming voice and someone to say, Here's the, here are the things that you can do. Here are some things that you can do in terms of changing aspects of your diet, you know, taking herbs that just made a huge difference. I want to get into the specifics of that, actually, just so people have a real concrete takeaway in terms of in, in improving odds. But I, there also has to be a big hormonal element to this, right? Oh in the sense gosh. that <laughs> making babies and giving birth to babies and breastfeeding babies are all very based in, in oxytocin, right? And, and oxytocin is created out of pleasure, out of joy, out of relaxation, and it is inhibited by stress hormones and adrenaline, right? And if you're feeling pressured, guilty, awful, negative, you're not creating any oxytocin at all. No joy. It's, there's no yeah. joy. There's no pleasure. It's likely that anything you do is not going to be successful, right? Um, so, so what, what are those things? What, you know, if, if we have watchers today who are, um, who are going through this and are wondering, what are the things they can do to maximize the chances and be healthy, be spontaneous, keep relationships on track? What are those things? For I think you nailed it too before with the joy factor. I mean, I talk about that a lot of like, we need to find more joy in your life. This cannot be 
you know, your only focus to, and, and talking about how the, the loss of spontaneity in the relationship, especially to just try to enjoy sex again with your partner, try to have date nights, try to not think about it so much. I mean, things that they say to just keep relationships healthy, it's still, still just general um, recommendations of just really finding what makes you happy again, because that happiness factor is just, it, it frees you up a lot. You know, women mainly come in and they're so stressed, they're so tense, they're so wrapped up. I mean, joy is the last thing on their mind and, and they don't really care about it because all they want to do is get pregnant sure. and then they'll be happy. Right. And it's like, no, you have to be happy now and then you will get pregnant, you know? So, so that's a big thing I work on with women. Of course, I do a lot of dietary changes, um, avoiding things that have pesticides that aren't organic, grass-fed okay. meats, eating animal products, eating healthy fats. Um, avoiding toxic beauty products, avoiding a lot of the chemicals that are known endocrine disruptors or hormone disruptors that are... Plastics? Plastics. I mean, that's where the, most of the research is right, right now, that's good. showing um, the effects of BPA on um, basically, you know, epigenetics, mm -hmm. which means basically our, the manifestation of our genes in our body and, and how we age. And so they're seeing a, a strong correlate between these these plastics or even other endocrine disrupting uh, compounds and how it's affecting our fertility. And similar for so, you recommendations? Very similar. In terms of toxic issues, I recommend people go on the EWG.org mm -hmm. environmental working group. It talks about uh, cosmetics and sh shampoos and everything, cleaning materials. But uh, regarding other issues, like I talk to husbands about their lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. no tub baths, no jacuzzis, no heated car seats, mm -hmm. no cell phones in your pants, yeah. no running around with, yeah. with very tight underwear or, or jock straps and so on. <laughs> um, to, uh, I had a couple that both were going to Bikram, Bikram yoga. Mm -hmm. I told, please, heat could hurt the eggs, heat could hurt yeah. the sperm. Wow. Two months later, they're yes. pregnant. Lifestyle it can be changes. Really simple. You know, you really have to think about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, even I tell people, don't try not to go through the uh, detectors at airports, the body scanners. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Right. Um, right. And, and what, what really got me interested in, in the alternative thing was uh, Alice Domar wrote a book, yes, that's a great book in the early '80s about mind body and how it mm -hmm. helped fertility and so on. And it turns out she was one of the students of her Benson at Harvard, mm -hmm. who's the father of mind, mind body, body and relaxation techniques. So you, you're, yeah. you're right about you know, relax as much as you can, but it's, it's hard. It's hard, it's but hard. I encourage meditation. I mean, I do. I'm a big meditator myself, and I say even five minutes. You know, even if it's like you have to go and sit in the bathroom stall at the office, I just want you to, like, sit there for two minutes and just breathe. Chill out. You, you know, know what they should have? Fertility doulas. <laughs> I what? like that. Right? Oh, Somebody to see you through the problem. Yeah. I'm just thinking of labor and how much it helps to have another woman. That's kind there. of what I do. I think. It's oh. very, it's, you know, it's what the evidence shows. So, do you debate a lot of other doctors about this? Because you see some of your approach is uh, pretty radical. I think they know my feelings about what they yes. do. And what, what, are your, what are your results? I mean, Amy was saying this, you know, that it's a very results driven field. I don't know what my results are. I know that, I know that my, I take on patients who have failed IVF repeatedly, I get a, many of them pregnant. Some of the people who are doing IVF, I get referrals from other doctors who are failing IVF, looking for reasons why people miscarry or fail IVF, mm -hmm. killer cells, kill, uh, cultures, and so on. I would say probably as many patients who come to me who failed IVF and they get pregnant, yeah. then people who fail with me go to IVF and they may get pregnant. It's a, I'm not against IVF. I'm just against the lack of a good evaluation. Yeah. And, and good looking at the husband, too. Yeah, absolutely. How many times have I said, oh, by the way, your husband's sperm's not good? And they say, but the doctor that I've ever seen is perfectly o okay or good enough. Mm -hmm. One of my patients had nine failed IVFs. It was a husband's fault all along. She now has two children when I referred him, the husband, to a specialist where they had a operation. The husband was put on Clomid, helped boost up his testosterone. It was... Non, it was a non-brainer. It was the husband's fault. Wow. But they're not looking at it. It's, I think it's too much time to give a proper diagnosis. It just seems, you know, um, and, and people get lost in the shuffle. And then also some of it is, you know, the woman feeling extremely anxious. We were talking about this in the, in the green room that she comes in and she's like, no, I'm going straight to IVF because I want to get pregnant yesterday. And I don't want to deal with any of this, and I don't want to change my diet, and I don't want to meditate every day. I have a lot of, a lot of friends and associates who've 
made appointments for fertility treatments when they've hardly been trying at all, yeah. Yeah. and then told, you know, said that they've been trying for a year or two years once they go in. They're just yeah. really scared. And my thing too is, it's, I've started to look at this as a broader perspective lately um, since, since the book came out and talking to women. It's like, we're not just trying to get you pregnant. That's not my primary goal. My primary goal is to get you to be really healthy so that you can get pregnant. Mm -hmm and then that you have a healthy pregnancy, pregnancy, and then that you actually have a healthy child that can actually get pregnant in 30 years when they want yes, to. Yes, and a healthy you know postpartum. What I mean? It's like, it's, it's, we're, we're changing generations here, not just one person, you know? And, and I think, you know, our society, we're just so fixated on this kind of short-term goal. Like, all we care about is a positive pregnancy test. Right. There's so much more to it than that. Right. Also, the financial factor. I mean, what, what is nine failed IVF Jesus. running somebody? What's the bill for? About 14 grand mm -hmm. times nine, so about 130. 200,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. 300,000, I yeah. don't know. And talk about the repercussions of all that medicine, too. Right. But right. what really bothers me, uh, from, from hearing one of the patients saying, to, oh, I saw this doctor, famous doctor in fertility, and geez, doctor, it costs so much, and he raises up, says, people put mortgages on their houses to mm -hmm. see me. Like, that is... I wouldn't take pride in that. That's not right. I'm yeah. yeah. proud of it. Obnoxious. Right, right. <laughs> so we're, we're going to run out of time, but... Um, if, if you could give one sort of piece of, of advice or wisdom to, to the audience, each one of you, what, what, would you, what would you say is one thing to just remember? That you have the power to change your health and improve your fertility. Don't give up hope. And, you know, that the ultimate goal is to be healthy. You know, you want to be healthy when you are a mom, too, you know, when you have a young child. So, you know, that, that you're trying to adjust your life and your lifestyle to be as healthy as it can be so that you have optimal health and then you can get pregnant and you will be you know, a good parent and, and birth healthy children. Yeah, so I have to say I agree with, with Amy and it's pretty much what I was going to say and similar to what was said during the fulfillment panel, the, you know, in terms of that, you know, the don't always think about the end goal, but think about sort of the, the journey. And mm -hmm. I, I think once I sort of, after I'd had the miscarriage and then I sort of just embraced just my, my health, trying to really feel feel good and, you know, not being totally focused on just getting pregnant mm -hmm. and sort of just enjoying my life and enjoying like my work and everything and my, my, the beautiful boy that I did have, um, it did change a lot of things. So, you know, my advice is, you know, um, sort of, yeah, be healthy, look at your life in its fullest possible way and, you know, talk to great people. I mean, also talk to your friends. Yeah, I have conversations. Is, I think this is a conversation that, you know, a lot of people don't have. I didn't have it with my friends. I definitely, I, I would go to Amy. <laughs> um, but now. And why I, not? I, 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 I mean, why didn't you have it with your friends? You know, what, what were your I friends do, I think there was that a bit of, maybe, I mean, just personally, I guess I felt a little bit of shame that, you know, why wasn't I, why wasn't I able to get pregnant? I got pregnant, you know, quickly the first time. I'm one of eight kids. My mom got pregnant like that, like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I think that's probably maybe, why. But now I, I definitely encourage, you know, friends and people that I know that are going through, you know, trying to get pregnant to, to talk about it. Be open. As a clinician, my advice is just empower yourself by knowing all about the field of fertility, both husband and wife. Get the, get the answers. Don't just take what the doctor tells you. Mm -hmm. I encourage patients to question me. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know the field or else you're going to be side side tracked somewhere else mm -hmm. don't take no for an answer don't ever take no for an answer great last words thank you all so much thank you <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you.